The devil has hundreds of landmines strewn all over the land in an effort to cause as many people as possible to be spiritually destroyed, and in the end, physically destroyed. And so let's continue to work while it's day, for the night is soon coming in which none of us will be able to work. This morning I'd like to study a subject that's been debated and argued over for centuries. And it's still a very important and hot topic to this day. On one side of the debate, there's the landmine of the devil that has been planted in an attempt to convince people that they can live in sin and still be in a saving relationship with Jesus and thus be ready to be whisked away to heaven when the Lord comes. And on the other side, God has a landmark of truth that will expose this landmine to our view so we can avoid stepping on it and thus be kept from a false sense of security. There's one thing we always want to keep in mind, and it's this. The main object of the devil. What did I say? The main object of the devil is to trick us into thinking that we can break God's commandments and still be saved. From the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, it's been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. This is the reason he rebelled against the Creator. And even though he and his cohorts were cast out of heaven for doing it, as it says in Revelation 12:9. He has continued to do the same thing here upon the earth, to deceive you and me and thus lead us to transgress God's law is the object or the goal which he has steadfastly pursued for thousands of years. And the last great conflict that's developing right now between truth and error, between the landmines and the landmarks, if you will, is but the final struggle of this long-standing controversy concerning the Ten Commandment Law of God. Can we who have a fallen, sinful human nature really live a life of obedience to God's law? Or will God save us in disobedience because He knows we really can't live life without sinning? This is the big debate. And believe it or not, the answer to these questions can be found by learning what the Bible says about the kind of human nature Jesus was born with when he entered this world as a babe in Bethlehem. Let's begin with prayer, and then we'll take a look at what holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Loving Father in heaven, we humbly bow in your presence this morning, thanking you for your word, and thanking you for a knowledge of the truth for these last days. And Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher this morning so that we can rightly discern what you want us to know. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. First of all, let's turn to Genesis chapter 5 and we'll learn what Moses said about how Adam came into this world when he was first created. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man. In the likeness of God made he him. In the likeness of God has to do with both physical form and moral character. This means that not only does our Creator have two arms, two hands, two legs, two feet, two eyes, and one head, but also that Adam's character was holy and without blemish, just like the one who made him. Now, this doesn't mean that Adam was God, but that in the beginning his inclination, like God, was only toward righteousness. Notice how Solomon supports this thought in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 
and verse 29. The wise man says, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man, how? Upright. That word upright means just or righteous. But they have sought out many inventions. The word inventions has to do with man's moral decline. So, in the beginning, man was just or righteous, but after sin entered, man produced something that didn't exist before. He invented new ways to sin and new ways to rebel against God. By the way, do you understand that Jesus is God and that he was the active agent in the creation of this world and of mankind? The God of the Old Testament? that gave the law from Mount Sinai, and the one in whose image Adam was created. Many Christians don't realize how involved Jesus was and is in our creation and redemption. When you think it through, it's only natural that the one who created us was also the one who died for us. In fact, if it was either one of the other two members of the Godhead that went to the cross, what would that have said about Jesus and his love for the beings he was responsible for creating? You see, he had to be the one to give up all to save the human race, else the plan of salvation would have been flawed and therefore a failure. But I digress from the subject at hand. Perhaps we'll study this more deeply another time. As we just read a moment ago, it was Moses who testified that the first man created came into the world in the likeness of God. But how did Jesus come into the world? Well, let's take a look at what the Apostle Paul said about the birth of Christ and whether or not it was different from that of Adam. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do. You see, the law cannot save you. It cannot forgive you. And it cannot give you the power to obey. But it does have the power to show us what sin is. And condemn us for breaking it. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son, how? In the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now, to condemn sin in the flesh means to live life without sin in sinful flesh. That's what Jesus did. And that's what he gives us power to do if we are willing to die to self and live through him. Verse 4 says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So, Paul testifies that Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. And no matter how you cut it, that's different than the way Adam was made, isn't it? Regardless of what one believes about the human nature of Christ, I think everyone would have to at least admit, after reading these two verses, that something was different between the way Adam came into this world and the way Jesus came into this world. The Bible says what the law could not do, because human nature was weak, God did. Isn't that something? God condemned sin in human nature by sending Jesus, who came with a nature like our sinful nature to conquer sin, and in the end, to finally do away with it completely. But why did he have to have a fallen human nature rather than a righteous, unfallen human nature like Adam had before he sinned? Well, it's because it wouldn't have been a bit helpful to us in our battle with temptation and character development. And besides, how could Jesus be our example in overcoming sin 
if he had a different human nature than we have. If he had, his example for us to follow wouldn't hold water because he would have had an advantage over us. It would have been like me telling my seven-year-old grandson to reach up and touch the ceiling, just like Papa can do. It couldn't be done. By the same token, if Jesus had to have an unfallen human nature to be successful in his battle against the temptation to sin, we could never hope to be successful with a fallen nature. Do you see? If our understanding is that Jesus was different than we are in this respect, then why would we even try to live a life of obedience to God's law, or even think it was necessary? If Jesus could not live without sinning with a fallen human nature, what makes us think we could do something that even he couldn't do? But someone says, when we accept Christ as our Savior, his sinless life stands in place of our sinful life, and thus, by God's grace, we receive eternal life. And this is absolutely true. But there's more to the gospel than just being declared righteous when we accept Christ. We must also be made righteous. We are justified when we first come to Christ. But there's more to our salvation we must also be sanctified or made holy through obedience to the truth so that we can remain in a justified state. You can read about that in John 17:17. 17, 17. But let me give you a personal example of how this works or how this happens. Before I came to Christ, all I had was a fallen, sinful human nature that was inclined towards sin. In fact, that's the way it was for everyone that has ever been born into this world. But when I came to Christ and accepted him into my life, I partook of his divine nature, as it says in 2 Peter 1.4. Partaking of the divine nature is what it means to be born again. When we receive Christ, we receive a new nature, his divine nature. And so now I have two natures, one sinful, the other divine, one fallen, the other unfallen. And so now I have a choice as to which one I'm going to follow and obey. And if I follow and obey the divine, I am sanctified by the truth. Does this make sense so far? When I decide to do what God wants me to do, there is a transmission of power to obey that comes through the Holy Spirit. And every time I do this, I'm being Christ-like. And so sanctification or holiness is a process that will continue on as long as I am here on this earth. Let's take a look at a couple verses in the Bible that will help us to better understand this point. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. Peter says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And according to John 1, verses 1 and 14, Jesus is the word made flesh. And so he is the incorruptible seed we get when we are born again. You see, it's not our human nature that becomes incorruptible. Our fallen nature remains fallen or corruptible, and it will be until the Lord comes, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 52-54. But when we receive the divine nature, that's when we're born again, because that's the incorruptible seed that creates the new birth. The reason we must be born again to receive salvation is because there's something wrong with our first birth. We need another nature in order to combat the cravings of the fallen flesh we were first born with. The divine nature doesn't automatically replace or overtake the fallen human nature, but it gives us the opportunity to make a better choice. 
And with the power of the Holy Spirit behind it, it can then empower us to victory over sin. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9 elaborates on this further and gives us a little more information. 1 John chapter 3. And verse 9, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, this doesn't mean that our power of choice to choose sin is taken away from us. It simply means that so long as the divine seed that was planted in our hearts remains in us, we will not continue to sin. Because Jesus and sin cannot abide in the same heart at the same time. However, if we choose not to abide in Christ, and we're always free to make that choice, sin is going to happen. Because that's all the fallen human nature can do when the divine nature is ignored. And whenever we do what our fallen nature wants us to do, we must repent and confess our sin in order for the divine nature to once again have access to our heart. In other words, whenever we sin, and sin is defined as transgressing any one of the Ten Commandments, according to 1 John 3, 4, whenever we sin, we must be born again, again in order for Jesus to once again abide. I think this point can be a bit difficult to grasp, and that's probably why it's hard for some people to comprehend. But it's absolutely necessary for a proper understanding of how our salvation is accomplished. Take a few minutes to read John 15, and that should help a little bit. All right, let's take a look now at a few other Bible texts that show clearly that Jesus had a human nature like ours. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning with verse 9. Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And by the way, that's the second death he tasted for every man, for you and for me. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified, that's us, are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now skip down to verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Not just humanity, but fallen humanity. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels... In other words, he didn't come to help the angels. The death of Christ was not for the angels' benefit, but for ours. And so he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on the seed of Abraham. Let me ask you a question. Did Abraham's offspring have a fallen nature? Absolutely. And so he took on that same seed. Wherefore? In how many things, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. 
The only way that Jesus could reconcile us to God was to succeed in the same nature that we fall in. He had to have victory over sin in the same nature that sin defeats us. That's the only way that reconciliation could take place between God and sinners. You see, the suffering of Christ was not on the cross alone. He suffered his whole life through being tempted, it says. In other words, whenever temptation came to Christ, he caused his sinful human nature to suffer by not giving in to it. And similarly, when we obey what the divine nature wants us to do, we cause our sinful nature to suffer because the fallen and the divine are opposed to each other. Notice what it says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Do you get it? If we're not causing our fallen flesh to suffer, that means we're giving in to sin. And if we're giving in to sin, we're not being sanctified by the truth. And therefore, we are negating that part of the gospel that will bring our character into conformity to God's will. You see, friends, if the devil can convince you that Jesus was different in his humanity than we are, then it's not hard for him to take you to the next step and also convince you that Jesus was able to live the kind of life that's impossible for you to duplicate. If you can become convinced that you cannot overcome sin, you won't. It's just that simple. If you don't believe you can stop sinning by choosing with the aid and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, to follow the divine nature you partook of when you allowed Jesus into your life, you won't. If you don't think it's possible or even necessary to live life the way Jesus lived it, you won't. I don't know how else to say it in order for you to better understand how important it is to our salvation. We must walk as Jesus walked. And God has supplied everything we need to be able to do that. If we are willing to be crucified with Christ, as it says in Galatians 2.20, we will be dead to our fallen nature. And dead people can't sin, can they? No. It's only as we allow self to be resurrected that we get in trouble. We must awake to righteousness and sin not, as the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.34. We can and must if we plan on spending eternity with all the redeemed of the ages. Let's take a quick look now at a couple verses in the Bible that speak of walking after the example of Christ. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 verses 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, Jesus, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Also, chapter 2 and verse 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Did Jesus walk in sin? Absolutely not. And we must do the same. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. 
1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. And so Jesus is our perfect example of patience in suffering and in not sinning. Romans chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. Paul says, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness. Here's a couple of antiquated words that means cohabitation or unrestrained sexual passion. We're not to walk that way. Not in strife and envying, but it says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. If we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, if we are wearing His robe of righteousness, if we partake of His divine nature, we're going to walk honestly and in the full light of day, just like He did. I think most Christians today understand and believe that Jesus is our substitute. They don't have a problem with that. But what they don't seem to realize or accept is that he's also our example. And examples are meant to follow. They're meant to be imitated or copied. That's what they're there for. And Jesus never asked us to do anything that is not in our ability to accomplish through his strength. Jesus not only died in our place, but he also showed us how to live in fallen flesh, and planted his divine seed in our hearts, and sent the Holy Spirit to give us a willingness and power to walk in his footsteps and to become like him in character. But the enemy of our souls comes along and suggests that this sounds good, but it's impossible to perform. And I say, baloney. But too many times we believe him over God, don't we? But this must change, friends, if we would follow the example of our Savior, because it's part of His plan for our restoration. Time's getting away from us here, so we'd better move on, because I want to hit one more important point before we finish. This whole idea of Jesus having a fallen human nature is something the Apostle John felt was extremely important, and he commented on it several times. Notice what it says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit. The word spirit here doesn't mean some ghost or whatever. It means simply breath or current of air. In other words, don't believe every person who's breathing, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. John is telling us here not to believe all who claim to have the Holy Spirit, but test them to find out if the spirit they have comes from God. There are many people today that claim to have the Spirit of Christ. But we're not just to take their word for it, but test what they say to see if it agrees with the Spirit that inspired those we know are true prophets, that is, those who wrote the Bible. Compare what they teach with what the Bible says. That's what we're supposed to do. And then in verse 2, it says, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit 
that confesses that Jesus is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. John makes it clear here that if people tell you that Jesus did not come in the flesh, they're of another spirit. Now, this is warning us about more than the fact that Jesus became a human being, flesh and blood, but that he became a certain kind of human being. If you go to a concordance for a definition of the Greek word flesh, you'll find something very interesting. You'll find that it means, and this is a quote, human nature with its frailties and passions, carnal or fleshly, unquote. And of course, fleshly or carnal embraces the lower corrupt nature. And so this is telling us in no uncertain terms that Jesus had a fallen human nature just like every other human being that was born into this world. And if someone teaches contrary to this, they are anti-Christ. They are against Christ. So if someone comes along and tells you that the only reason Jesus was able to live a sinless life was because he had an unfallen human nature, you can know that what they are saying is against what the gospel of Christ teaches. By the way, every time you read the word flesh in the New Testament, it means carnal or fallen flesh. I think there are two times it refers to animal flesh, but every other time to fallen human flesh. And so you'll want to take that into consideration whenever you read the word flesh in the New Testament. It means fallen flesh. Go also to Second John, verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and and Antichrist. And then verses 10 and 11. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. Why? For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Are you beginning to see how important it is for us to understand these things? Don't invite them into your house as an honored guest or bid them Godspeed, that is to say, be well and prosperous in what you're doing. If we do, we are as guilty as they are for preaching another Jesus and another gospel, as the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 4. If we know a person is teaching this falsehood, we have an obligation to warn them and even disassociate ourselves from them if they refuse to accept the truth on this point. It's really quite important because we don't want to be guilty of being classed with Antichrist. Let's take a look at a couple more verses before we close. Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Did unfallen Adam have any infirmities regarding his nature? No. He had no feebleness, no weakness of body or mind, and his nature was unaffected by sin. But Jesus, dear friend, accepted humanity 
when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. And so Jesus can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And he was in all points, it says, tempted like as we are yet without sin. What a wonderful Savior we have. One who was willing to leave the heavenly courts to come down to this sin-cursed earth and live life the way we have to live it. To take upon himself our fallen human nature and never give in to the lusts of the flesh, not even once, thereby not only saving us from the penalty of sin by dying the death upon the cross that we deserve to die, but giving us an example that we too can follow in his steps and live a victorious Christian life by partaking of his divine nature. Once we understand this, verse 16 tells us what to do when we need divine help in order, like Jesus, to resist temptation. Verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our loving Father in heaven, we come to you very humbly this morning to thank you for offering salvation full and free. Please accept our gratitude for allowing us to be called the children of God. It's only because of your great sacrifice on our behalf that we are able to come boldly unto the throne of grace this morning to obtain mercy for those times when we have not obeyed your voice and grace to help during our greatest time of need. We're thankful, too, for the clarity of your word and that Jesus was willing to take upon himself our fallen human nature, that we might have the power to walk even as he walked. May we see the importance of partaking of your divine nature and obey the promptings of your sweet spirit that we might be more than conquerors through him that loved us. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.